Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's HCA Bionet Fogarty Collaborative Research Seminar Series. We have two wonderful speakers presenting to you today. Hannah, um, who is from Nast in Ghana, and Joyce, who's from Pwani. Hannah will be doing her presentation first. So Hannah, while I do your introduction, would you mind beginning to share your slides and your screen? And then I will continue doing your introduction. So Hannah Nyoko is a graduate student of the Kwame um, University of Science and Technology in Ghana, pursuing a degree in info biodata analytics and computational genomics. She currently holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry from the same university. And she's also currently a fellow of the West African Sustainable Leadership and Innovation Training in Bioinformatics Research Training Program, which is funded by Fogarty, the NIH. She's currently under the supervision of Dr. Pandam Salifu and her current research focuses on the genetic profiling of breast cancer among African populations to decipher the differences in prognosis of breast cancers in various ethnicities. Hannah is fascinated by the use of computational and statistical methods to understand the molecular mechanisms by which disease genes function, leading to the design of rational targeted therapy. And she hopes to work towards addressing the gap in disease diagnosis and treatment resulting from research biases across various ethnic populations, particularly in Africa. So Hannah, as soon as you are ready, you may begin your presentation. I would just like to note that at the end of Hannah's um, seminar, we will be releasing a quick poll with just three questions related uh, to her presentation and her slides. This is the first time that we'll be doing it. So it would be great if for those of you who are online could participate in the poll. The poll is anonymous and we'll just be asking for some very, very basic feedback um, on the graphics and design of the presentation that we'll be able to feed back to the presenters at the end of the session. So without me saying too much more, Hannah, you're welcome to take the floor. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Good day, everyone. <laughs> I'm Hannah Nyako from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and I'm presenting on the molecular profiles of breast cancer in diverse ethnicities. So breast cancer by far ranks as the number one form of cancer number one form of cancer mortality in women and then the second most prevalent form of cancer worldwide. It accounts for about 2.1 million diagnoses in both men and women. Hello. We can hear you, Hannah, please continue. Sorry, my slide was not moving. Thank you. So breast cancer by far ranks as the number one cause of cancer mortality in women and the second most prevalent form of cancer worldwide. Specifically in Ghana, we find that there had been an increase in breast cancer mortality rates by about 80%, and then in the prevalence by about 58.6% within six years. In West Africa specifically, we face up to six deaths in eight breast cancer patients within five years. So what's this breast cancer we talk about? Generally, it could be thought, or breast cancer could be thought of as a collection of diseases with respect to its broad heterogeneity. Clinically, it is classified based on such features as tumor morphology, the tumor stage, the grade, or histological appearances. But lately, classifications based on expression patterns, which classifies breast cancer into molecular intrinsic subtypes is widely supported. And then these subtypes we have include the luminal A subtype, the luminal B subtype, A2 overexpressed, 
the basal like and then the normal like subtypes. Now, each of these subtypes vary by biological properties and as well as their varying disease outcomes. So, for instance, we find that the lumina A subtype has the worst prognosis and it's also the most common form of breast cancer there is. The basal like subtype and then the less commonly known collagen low subtype, on the other hand, happens to be the most aggressive form of breast cancer we have. Now, it is worth noting that the basal-like subtype actually forms or makes up about 5% of triple negative breast cancers, which accounts for 15 to 20% of breast cancer diagnosis. Now, due to advances in early detection and improvement in treatment, breast cancer survival has substantially increased over the last decade, particular, and this is particularly in developed countries. However, there continues to be significant racial disparities in breast cancer survival. For instance, a study reported that mortality rate due, uh, due to breast cancer was four times higher in African-American women as compared to European-American women. And this was irrespective of the tumor stage, the grade, or the therapy timeline. Now, this disparity most likely arises from differences in bi the biology of the breast cancers that's between diverse ethnicities. And this is as a result of the intrinsic genetic diversities amongst populations. Now, the heterogeneity of this diversity happens to be maxed by the generalization of genomic research discoveries, which are meant to improve breast cancer diagnostics and treatments. Um, and this has been a challenge, which is met by the underrepresentation of minority populations, particularly developing countries or African countries specifically in these forms of studies or genomic studies. Therefore, to elucidate the possible distinct biological mechanisms or pathways of breast cancer carcinogenesis or prognosis in diverse ethnicities, we sought to investigate the molecular profiles of breast cancers in diverse ethnicities. So specifically, we seek to look at the gene or investigate the gene expression profiles, the genomic alterations within the populations, and then epigenetic modifications within various populations. So to achieve this aim, the study focuses on assessing at a multi-omic level several breast cancer data sets from various or diverse ethnicities. And we'll be looking at uh, studies in transcriptomics, epigenomics, and then genomics, as well as clinical analysis. But for this study in particular, We'll be focusing on gene expression analysis, or this is a preliminary study. And um, so in this study, we analyzed the gene expressions of TCGA breast cancer profiles. And then we, uh, for that, we extracted 1,087 breast cancer samples, which we split into the three groups. That's the Asian, the Black or African-American, and then the white groups. And then we performed a Kaplan near survival analysis on these groups by race. From these or from this, we extracted 5, 29, and then 60 triple negative breast cancer subtypes for each, for the Asian, Black, and then the white population respectively. Then perform the gene expression analysis and a subsequent, a subsequent downstream analysis to 
identify enriched pathways and functional terms. In exploring the TCGA responsive data sets we obtained, we identified that the white and then the Asian population happen to have the, have the luminal subtype being the most prevalent form or the most prevalent form of breast cancer in these groups. So we have the lumina A being a 58.5% in the white group and then a 34.43% in the Asian group, which is the highest for that, those groups. Then for the African population, on the other hand, the most prevalent cancer or the cancer that breast cancer that presented most was the basal-like subtype. And this represents 35.56% of the breast cancers within the Black American or Black or African American group. And this was in accordance with the kaplan meyer survival curve, which is shown in this figure here. So the African American group we see has the least survival rates, and this could be attributed to, to due to the um, prevalence of the basal-like subtype, which we know is the most aggressive. The expression profiles from all three samples were then explored for with using the PCA for for sample classification. So the samples were found to be in two clusters. Now we have this cluster here representing the white, representing the control pop, the control group, and then this cluster here representing the diseased group. However, we are able to identify any distinctions between the races. That's the Asian, the black, and then the white populations. Now, having run uh, the differential expression analysis for each of the groups, we identified that the African and then the American, the African and then the white group shared the most number of genes. That's 2,602. Whilst um, there were only 53 genes shared amongst all the groups. And then this diagram we have here represents the heat map of gene expressions across all the samples. That's for, and this is for the top 20 genes or top 20 differentially expressed genes we identified. Now, looking into these genes, we find that they are mainly terms enriched in mitotic cell cycle, and then microtubule organization, spindle assembly, and chromatid organization, which are all well implicated in breast cancer progression. We then run an enrichment analysis of all our gene sets and found that the black and the white population, when found that the sets or the terms enriched in the black and white populations were, were almost or were similar as compared to the Asian population. So for the white population, we find the terms being involved in processes that's uh, pertain to cell cycle, the cell cycle division or chromosome assembly, centromere assembly. The Asian group, on the other hand, uh, had processes and enriched with um, in basically metabolic processes, such as the retinoic acid metabolic process and then the tyrosine metabolic process. Now, examining the genes that were enriched in similar biological processes between the black and then the white populations, we, find, we found the mis 18 a vl one and then the SEMP-H genes being distinct to the white population. And, and these were enriched in the centromere complex assembly, SEMP-A containing nucleus assembly and then the SEMP 
and then the scent A containing chromatin organization tins. For the black population, we found the CNB, we found the CCNBI ESPL1, then the KIF23 and KIF CI1 genes being distinctively enriched in the mitotic sister chromatic segregation team. Uh, in literature, the CCNBI and KFC1 gene have been implied in West breast cancer outcomes. KFC1 in particular has made lines as a promising therapeutic target for triple negative cancer. And this is due to its role in centrism clustering in cancer cells. So typically centrism amplification tends to contribute to aneuploidy. And then this is correlated with higher tumor grade, and then poor patient prognosis. Uh, this shows the net, a network of the relationship between uh, enriched, path, uh, enriched pathways. Now, for, uh, in this, just as we had seen in the biological processes, there seemed to be a similar pattern in and enriched pathways between the white and then the black population. So we find a network of enriched uh, terms being, being progesterone mediated oocyte maturation, cell cycle, oocyte meiosis, or cell senescence, both in the white and then the black population. In the Asian population, on the other hand, we find Term significantly enriched in breast can in pathways in cancer, PI3K, AKT signaling pathways, and focal adhesion pathways. So we further explored the genes enriched in four, enriched in four of the significant pathways we identified. Four of the significant pathways that were identified. And then we found that the CDK2 gene, which is enriched in, or which is found in all the enriched terms, happened to be well enriched, happened to be poorly regulated or poorly regulated or have, have a lower expression level within the black population as compared to the white of the as compared to the white population. And then there's most importantly, this C2DK gene in a further exploration on the CBIO portal showed um, a poorer survival rate of lower CD2K expression levels as compared to the higher CD2K expression levels. Now, although these, uh, the relationship we identified between survival rates and lower expression levels was insignificant from the CBIO portal. <clears throat> it could still be a gene of interest for exploration of racial prognostic differences in breast cancers. Now, furthermore, we find that the furthermore we find furthermore we find that the progesterone the progesterone mediated oocyte maturation signal is has a, this block of genes here, which is distinctive, which is distinctive to only the black population, which is distinctive to only the white population. And then we find the FZR1 being distinct to the black population. Now the F the FZR1 particularly has been um, identified as a novel biomarker for just uh, for for triple negative breast cancers. Now, looking into uh, differentially expressed genes, we try to identify um, genes that were distinctive to uh, various populations. That's the whites 
the black and then the Asian population. So this diagram here shows the grouping of the topmost differentially expressed genes in all our groups. And then this portion here in the middle that's between the white and then the black populations shows the genes that were differentially expressed in both the black and then the white population. Now, looking into the white population, we find that the genes that were distinctive to this group were mainly upregulated. And then on the other hand, we find the genes distinctive to the black group being mainly downregulated. For the Asian group, we identified that all the differentially expressed genes identified were actually downregulated. Thus, we performed a further study to assess the enrichment patterns in each of these genes, in genes that were exclusive to the, each of the groups, that's the whites, the black, and then the Asian population. And then for the white population, the genes were found to be enriched in processes involved in cardiac muscle fiber development, myofibril assembly, muscle filament slide, and, and actin and actin myosin, actin myosin filament sliding. For the black population, for the black population, on the other hand, had genes majorly enriched in terms involved in mitochondrial translation elongation, mitochondrial translation termination, mostly with mitochondrial translation. And then this hints at a, a possible role of alterations in mitochondrial DNA in triple negative breast cancer within the black population. The Asian groups, on the other hand, uh, we found at least just three, just three genes that were distinct to this group. And then they, they were found to be enriched in or two of the genes were found to be enriched in positive regulation of fever generation or positive regulation of bone modeling. So in a next step, we assess the survival rate of the top three genes for each group enriched in the enriched and then so for the wise group, we selected the TCAP, TTN, MYH6, and then for the black group, the CL, SLC46A, SLC19A, SLC25A, and then all the genes for the Asian group. So this diagram we have here shows an oncoprint of um, mRNA profiled expressions. And then we have these six genes here. So the bars, the rows represent the genes and then the bars represent the individual samples within the TCGA database. And then in this, we find that for the TNFSF1, F11 gene um, was altered in about 7% of the breast cancer samples within the TCGA database. So in our analysis, all the genes actually seem to show no significant difference in survival rates between the altered, between the unaltered group and then the altered gene. However, uh, for the DIOS gene, which we find distinctive to the Asian group, we see um, <clears throat> a significant decrease in survival rate within this group. And then we saw a same uh, pattern for the CL SLC25832 gene, which showed a significant decrease in survival rate. Generally, from this study, we find that the African American population had the greatest number.
number of differentially expressed genes. And uh, this has been confirmed in this has been confirmed in various or previous studies already. And then the population also presented, or the Black American population also presented with the least survival rates as compared to the other populations. We also identified that the differentially expressed genes identified within the data sets were mainly enriched in processes involved in cell cycle processes, DNA replication, chromosome organization. And then um, we also noted that although the functional terms identified in the white and then the black populations were in agreement in most parts, there were still some just Think there are still the distinctions remained within the gene level, that is the expression level of the genes, and then the genes that the actual genes that were being um, enriched in those terms. That's for this study, we identified the KFC1, CDK2, CR1, CL, SLC25832, and DIOS genes could be of great importance in exploring special prognosis diversities in breast cancer. Thus, in further studies, we will seek to investigate further the prognostic, the significance of these genes uh, to prognosis and then amongst the risks, uh, to prognostics to prognosis values among the races. And then we also hope to include more data sets from diverse groups or diverse ethnicities to assess the differential, to assess the pattern of um, changes in expression or in their profiles. We would also like to explore um, this data set leveraging information from um, a multi-omic level data set. So we would be would like to involve the involve the information from genomics, genomic analysis, and then epigenomic analysis to identify specific differences within or an in-depth specific difference within uh, ethnicities. And then moreover, we would also like to actually include um, an actual African breast cancer data set in our further studies. Um, it has been noted in a previous study or a Nigerian study that breast cancer in African populations are actually more aggressive than even the African American populations. And so it would be very essential to include an actual African data set. So these are my references and acknowledgement to my supervisor, Dr. Salifu, and then to my sponsors there or sponsors for this project, the Fogarty International Center, NIMS Ghana, and then Wasledbury. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really compelling and interesting conversation, Hannah. Um, we will not be able to take questions at the moment. Um, we are a little bit over time. We are going to go straight into Joyce's presentation and we'll take questions um, directed at both presenters right at the end of Joyce's presentation. So thank you very much, Hannah. Can I please ask you to stop sharing your screen and then for Joyce to begin sharing hers. While Joyce is busy loading her presentation. I will go ahead and do a quick introduction for her. So Joyce Kabageni is an Ian Bit and IDEAL funded student pursuing a master's in bioinformatics at Pwani University in Kenya. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Technology from Kiambonga University, Uganda. And before joining EM, but she worked with an immunomodulation and vaccines program at the MRC at UVRI in Uganda Research Unit, 
While there, she worked on various projects that aim to understand immune responses to vaccines such as BCG and MVA85A and how helminth infections may influence these immune profiles. Currently, Joyce is at Kemri Welcome Trust Program undertaking her research project titled Machine Learning in Mining Data for Biological Associations, Congenital Infections and Immune Responses to Vaccines. The project aims to understand effects of congenital infections on infants' immune responses to EPI vaccines and common childhood infections using machine learning approaches. Joyce, whenever you are ready, you may go ahead and start your presentation. While Joyce starts out her presentation, I'm going to just release a quick poll for Hannah's presentation. There are just three quick questions uh, based on the quality of the presentation. It would be great that the for those of you who are willing to respond, to respond, it's completely anonymous. I will leave the poll open for a couple of minutes um, while Joyce gets into a presentation and then stop it and then I will release one for Joyce right ahead of the Q&A. So Joyce, you're welcome to go ahead. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry. So my name is Joy Kalageni. I'm a bioinformatics student, masters in bioinformatics here at Fun, funded by Ianbit. So today I'll be taking you through my uh, master's research project for the submitted thesis. And this work uh, was supervised by Dr. Charles Sandy at Kemri Welcome Trust here in Kilifi, and Dr. Manamze from Pan University. Uh, basically, my, my work for a layman, in summary, I, I tried to apply machine learning to mine biological data, large serological data, to understand whether if uh, infants are exposed to certain infections while still in the womb, whether those infections would affect how they develop their immune system in terms of how they respond to vaccines that are given in the first year of life, or how they respond to common childhood infections, which is a reflection of how well they will develop their immune system. That's for a summary. So some of these infections, this table is uh, showing a summary of some of the congenital infections that I looked at. Some of them can be, I'll be moving this cursor for us to follow. So some of them can be uh, transmitted in utero or perinatal just before birth or during birth or even during uh, the nine months of uh, pregnancy within the mother. And we, here also I show a summary of the general prevalence of most of them. And, and most of them are actually highly prevalent within the population. So there's a possibility for them to be transferred or uh, yeah, from the mother to the child while sitting in the womb. Some, uh, even if for most of these infections, the clinical outcomes are clearly documented. For most of them, there's no much work that has been done to see how they affect immune development or immune responses in infants and in the long run later in life. Uh, from literature, some of them, for example, CMV has been shown to cause excessive T cell activation, which may lead to exhaustion. And that is not good for someone's immune response to any pathogen. And uh, for some others, for example, rubella and hepatitis B, nothing has been shown yet. Here I show a graph from some of the work uh, that has been done by Hook and friends, where they observed that infants that were positive for this toxoplasma gonda is also one of the congenital infections. So infants that were positive for toxoplasma gonda were expressing less CD4-16 uh, cells. These CD4-16 cells are actually monocytes. They are mainly carried on monocytes and macrophages, which are basically the first line of defense once someone sees a pathogen before the next processing of the immune system. So if an infant has lower um, CD16 cells, 
it could possibly affect how they generally handle that infection. Um, so if I wanted to look at how all the list that I've already showed you, if you if I wanted to look at all those congenital infections and how they would affect infants in terms of how they respond to different vaccines and different childhood infections over the first period of life, I would end up generating a lot of data, which uh, is multi-structured and currently there is no systemic way uh, of analyzing such data without being biased because you're testing for many things at the same time. So I, I wanted to devise a way of un, un, unbiasedly handling such data and drawing biological conclusions from such data. And um, so for my specific really objectives as a bioinformatician was to come up with a, an unsupervised um, machine learning based approach of analyzing such large serological data. And so once I've developed that, I, uh, I, dis I was supposed to now assess using the data that I would have had from the lab to assess whether the children that are exposed to these congenital infections while in the womb really don't have good responses to vaccines and uh, other childhood infections. So this was my study cohort. We had uh, um, infants that were recruited here at Kilifi in 2002 and 2003. And um, these infants had been sampled at birth, and then consecutively for every after three months until two years of age. So that's the cohort I used. And um, I chose infants or samples that are stored. I chose samples that have uh, an infant that had been sampled from birth. They must, they must have had a cord blood and then at least seven other time points after birth. So I ended up with um, about 100 or so infants and I tested for uh, congenital infections, responses to congenital infections, vaccine, and other childhood infections over that whole time point. And this I did by microarray. I have not put the slide here for the technique, but in case someone needs, I can show it later. So generally, uh, the results, we observed that uh, these congenital infections are actually really present with us in this population, and the highest of them being CMV and HSV. And then uh, just a confirmation, I plotted these graphs to show that the people that had been classified as positive for these congenital infections, the infants, actually had higher antibody responses to those pathogens. Here I'm using CM, CMV as a, just a mode of pathogen, but every other antigen looks like that. So once I had identified the infants that have been exposed to these congenital infections, now I needed to identify uh, which vaccine responses am I going to focus on. So for this talk, I'm going to share results from just three vaccines and these are given at the same time and so we expect that they will look exactly the same if if a, an infant has been given that vaccine they will have a response to all the three antigens so here i selected now the infants that were recorded as vaccinated and this is how their kinetics look like on the x-axis we have the edge in terms of days and the y-axis is their antibody response to this specific um, antigen. So each line, the red is uh, a vaccine for DPT, diphtheria toxin. Uh, this uh, black one is um, Bordetella pertussis, which is uh, the vaccine against whooping cough and then the third one is for uh, hepatitis C. So we see that these vaccines are given three times and you, these uh, one, two, three lines are the time points where these vaccines are given. So indeed, once a, a child has been born, 
the first time point is zero, is um, zero, zero days literally from the womb. They have some IgG that comes from the mom, but with time it went down. And now when they are given these vaccines, as we can see for these infants, there's an increase in terms of responses. So I selected all the infants that uh, were vaccinated and the ones that were not vaccinated looked like this. So I believed in the selection because clearly here there's no increase in response and others are just going down, meaning they didn't receive the vaccine. So once I had the group of the vaccinated infants, I also had to select now infants that have been exposed to the common childhood infections. So the common childhood infections, I chose to select. So these are survival curves. Each of these is the population response uh, to these uh, antigens or pathogens. And you see that for this, let's say rota, by the time it's one year, almost half of the infants had been exposed to rota almost um, over 75 had been exposed to CMV. And now for such, like this Koksake, it's an adenovirus, um, even less than 25 were exposed. So I, I didn't analyze this as common infection. So I selected only those that proved to have been in the population by response, by survival curve. So just to also visualize it, for those that I ended up selecting, we see that uh, this is zero, three months like that. Each bar is a, a time point over the two years. And we see that for these that I ended up selecting as the common ones, infants had responses all through like, uh, the first years of life. So once I had selected now the common infections and who was infected and who was not infected, and then who was vaccinated and who was not vaccinated. Now I fed that data into a cluster analysis to see whether they are just, um, here, let me show you. Uh, so let's imagine this is now the data, it's all the data that I have. I put it all into the model and I use k-means or PAM clustering to determine whether there is any clustering that is just out of the data without me assigning groups to the data. And I, I used a silhouette graph to assess how homogeneous the different clusters were. So this is the result that I got. For vaccine responses, I observed that um, the infants clustered in two different clusters, as we can see here. And then the infants in the uh, cluster number two actually had higher responses to these vaccines compared to those in cluster number one. And then for uh, common childhood infections, still that clustering into two clusters and, and uh, cluster number two infants had lower uh, uh, responses to these common childhood infections. So I went ahead now to use random forests to assess whether there's any congenital exposure that is driving this kind of clustering that I was observing. So here, for in terms of clustering, due to the, in terms of clustering of responses to common infections, we found that um, CMV being exposed to CMV or HSV, as we see from here on this graph. CMV or HSV or this other CMV having a response to these antigens, meaning exposure, drove the clustering to appear the way it did. Meaning uh, HSV and CMV could be associated with uh, hyper-responsiveness in terms of these clusters that we observed. And then for vaccine responses, we observed that only HSV had the influence. So then I went ahead because I had just used random forest. So I wanted to look at other uh, machine learning algorithms and how they perform and how like which congenital infection will they predict uh, to have an association between 
the responses that we are seeing and um, how well are they predicting these conjoint infections. So I split my data into 60% and I assigned it as the training set and 40% as the test set. And then my predictor variable was centered really just for scaling to make sure that uh, what I'm processing will make sense. And I tested neural networks, support vector machines. I added the random foresters earlier and naive bias models. And so what I observed in terms of, so I, I looked at in terms of how accurate are they detecting these congenital infections, what's their recall uh, capacity, precision and sensitivity. And what I noticed is that all these models performed comparatively similar and they all predicted these uh, infections, congenital infections as ones that are important for driving the clustering of the uh, responses that we are seeing. And interestingly, they ranked CMV at 100 and, and they also ranked them at the same level of, of importance. So to to really wrap up everything from my master's project, I was able now to develop this uh, unsupervised approach, which is machine learning based, that could help us to analyze this data in an biased way, and which can be adopted by any other person looking at the same stuff. And I was able to identify two or three congenital infections that could be associated or could have an influence on the immune responses to vaccines and infections, as we've seen, CMV and HSV are the most important ones. And uh, this knowledge, really, I believe that it can be now leveraged on by people who have interest in immunology or infection biology to really uh, go down and study how, how, how do these infections actually lead to this kind of effect? And um, I'd like to acknowledge all, all of you for listening. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors and the team, the VEC team here at Camry and all my funders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for another really, really interesting presentation. Amazing work. It sounds like you've yeah. just about wrapped up your master's, so congrats on that. Yeah. <laughs> well <laughs> Thank done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to just quickly launch um, the poll for choice just for a couple of minutes. And while I'm doing that, I'd like to just lay a few crown rules for a quick Q&A um, with both Joyce and Hannah. So in order to, to ensure that we don't interrupt anyone while they are speaking, I would like to request that you raise your hand should you have a question. We will call on you and you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Alternatively, you are also welcome to type your question into the chat box. Uh, please just let us know which presenter the question is directed at, whether it's presenter one, Hannah, or presenter two, Joy so that they know which um, presenter needs to respond to the question. So I'll formally open the floor for questions now. Please go ahead. Go ahead, Shahid. Yes, please. Good evening. Hello? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Hannah and Joyce, for wonderful presentations. Uh, I think I have one question for Joyce. Um, I've seen you have used the K-means clustering, mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like your data really has a lot of features that you are considering. Uh, maybe is there any way you can brief us on the rationale why you chose K-means clustering over any other method of clustering or normal PCA? Oh, so 
Thank you, Shahid. So basically, because this was um, an exploratory kind of uh, analysis or workflow plan, I literally tried out every other clustering. So I tried palm clustering, Kenny, hierarchical, and um, and I tried also the PCS. But the good thing with this other clustering is that it can, if you have a large data set, if you use the other clusterings other than PS, PCA, you have stronger power. Although every other clustering method that I used landed on the same, uh, the same conclusion. So I, 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 I first had to determine if there is any uh, division of my data without any thought, and I used uh, uh, NB clustering, which determined that the, uh, the best number of clusters are actually two. And then now I tried it with all the other clustering methods and still they were giving me two. So I just presented the K-means clustering, just, <laughs> but every other one looks like that. Okay, thank you. Mm. Thanks so much for your question, Shahid. Are there any other questions for either Joy or Hannah? Hi, Victor. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is a question for Hannah. Um, I found it interesting, your observation that there are, uh, you know, pathways or clusters of genes that are differentially um, activated or um, downregulated in breast cancer in different ethnic groups. Yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, what, what worries me a little bit is that uh, you had a single data set that relied heavily on uh, African Americans. And I was wondering whether there are any other data sets that you could use to confirm the observations you made in African Americans. I mean, there's a lot of gene expression data out there, particularly in breast cancer. Um, I just don't know what the data sets are, but I was wondering if there, there, are, there is another or more than one data set that you could use to verify that your conclusions are correct. Hannah, do you just want to go ahead and answer that question? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> no okay. problem. So, so this was um, a preliminary study we did, and um, we worked with I worked with the data I had available, which was the TCG. But in further studies, um, the study hasn't ended yet, and I would be including data sets from several ethnicities as well. To, I, I hope that one would um, help validate whatever we would be finding. Well, the question is more not to use different ethnicities, but to use other, um, other data sets, either from African Americans or even better, that were done on uh, actually Africans from the African continent and whether yes. when you analyze those data sets, you reach the same conclusions. Yes. Okay, so um, I haven't used any of that, but so far there was one data set, I, there's one data set I have identified in the African population and on gene expressions and, and genomic studies. And so I would like to include that one as well. But we have applied for it, that data set and awaiting access or approval. 
Okay, so you're you're waiting for approval by, from the uh, data access committee or something like that. Yes, please. Okay, and I hope it goes through. It, it's really sad when these kinds of studies cannot be done because people are too protective of their data. Yes, thank you. Definitely agree, Victor. Um, and Hannah, good luck with that. I think it, the results should be really, really interesting. Should it actually be the same? Uh, it probably might change. And that would be really interesting too. So good luck with, with the study going forward, definitely. Um, Pandam, I see you have your hand raised as well. Do you have a question for either Hannah or Joy? Uh, thank you. It's just a, a comment and follow up to Victor uh, question. Um, we really have a, uh, a difficulties in assessing um, uh, supposed publicly available data. Um, sometimes it's not just the um, ethics committee's um, problem. It's also a general issue that we face uh, in our institution. Just getting our local institution signing officer to approve for us to even um, uh, for the uh, access committee request is a, a big challenge. Uh, we requested several data and set, uh, since uh, April. Up to date, just signing officers clicking, uh, up, um, uh, accepting to the request is a, a big um, challenge. Uh, upon uh, several requests and personal meetings, is, is still uh, not, we are not um, making headway. Thank you for that comment, Pandam. I, it's even sadder when it's bad when people don't let other their colleagues access their data. It's even worse when an institution doesn't let its own researchers do their work. But I guess, unfortunately, these things happen. Yeah, well, we, we hope that you do get access to that data set, Hannah, and that, that access agreement does actually get signed off. Okay. Thank you. So we do have just a few minutes left before the end of the session. So if there are any last minute questions, now would be an opportune time to ask them. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. There's a question in the chat box directed at Joy. I will just read it out for you, Joy. Um, what are the possible applications of your results? Okay, thanks, Oscar. Uh, so for my results, in terms of the bioinformatics part or the data handling part, I think it's a, it's a good approach to do analysis unbiased. I think that is really nice. And uh, for the biological part, I hope that these results can draw our attention to the fact that uh, we need to understand these congenital infections and what possibility, uh, what possibly they have, what effect they possibly would have on the immune development of these infants. Because this is just preliminary data and we've not known that much about how they can affect the infants. But in case we do like further studies and infection studies and we can tell which path, which which immunological pathways are they using to attenuate these uh, responses, or uh, how do they actually do it? We would then consider maybe maternal vaccination for these infections, so that the infant can develop the. Uh, the response while still in the pod, in the in the womb, even before they are exposed, or just making sure that we focus on treatment of these uh, infections within the population, those that can be treated, so that the mother, while they are going for antenatal care, they can know that if I'm positive for this kind of infection, I could be treated, or if it's not treatable, then we will know how to deal with the infants once they are born. 
because it's just really shedding light on what is there, what we haven't focused on for a long while. Yeah. Thanks so much, Joy. Oscar, I hope that answers your question. Um, we are unfortunately just, just about out of time. So I'd like to just once again, thank both Joy and Hannah for the really wonderful presentations. Good luck with all of your work going forward. This is really, really interesting work to both of you, really great work. Thank you to everyone who managed to join us on such short notice. Um, to those of you who were involved in 16S earlier and still managed to be here now, thanks a lot <laughs> for soldiering through. Um, we'll see you then in about two weeks for the next Fogarty presentation. Um, it's great to see that the turnout is in increasing a little bit now and hopefully at our next presentation we'll have a similarly good term turnout. Um, we'll try and get those adverts going out sooner rather than later so that you can all add those ads to your calendar and those dates to your calendars. So thank you very much, um, Albert and Rolando, who helps me with the seminars. I'm not sure if either of you would like to add anything very quickly. No, thanks, Verena. Good. Yeah. Hi, Verena. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. We will see you in two weeks then.